11 years old, my family decided to move from Quito, Ecuador's bustling capital city, to a sleepy little town in central Florida. I remember to this day, the day my papi came to pick me up from school and very casually asked me what I thought about moving to Los Estados Unidos. Are you kidding me? I thought. The place where DJ Tanner lives in those gorgeous Victorian homes? <laughs> Duh. I thought it would fit right in. I mean, I was a pretty bright kid. President of my sixth grade class. Hula hoop champion. Not to brag or anything. Um, but you know, I, whenever we moved to the States, even though I thought this bright kid right here would have a life that looked like an episode of Full House, with the golden retriever, an upper middle class existence with no racial tensions among friends or neighbors. <laughs> what, what I actually found out is that there was something about the color of my skin, my accent, and my immigration status that led my new teachers to believe that I wasn't very bright. Who the hell was I in this new world? Uh, why didn't anybody bother to explain how my social identities would change so dramatically in my new home? kind of felt like being dropped off in the middle of the woods with a blindfold and no map. So in order to find my way and figure out where I was, I had to listen to my surroundings. Of course, that usually showed up in the form of stereotypes or the narrow representation of people who look like me in the media. Back in the early 2000s, that looked like J-Lo, Gypsy from Gilmore Girls. I don't know if she was even at Next, but it was pretty limited. And of course, then there's what I learned from my family and my community. So pretty quickly, I learned which of my identities, not back to that one, which of my identities were punishable, right? Which, which of my identities were perhaps even worth hiding? Later on, with lots of self-reflection and through conversations, I also learned that I embody lots of identities that I don't even have to think about because they afford me lots of privilege and a sense of safety simply because they're considered the norm. In this long journey back to myself, I found that the most reliable and efficient compass was really the power of, of storytelling and, and the power of listening to the sto stories of others. And the way that I learned about the power of story was actually through my involvement in the feminist movement. I remember as a college student being invited to a feminist organizing meeting, and I was ready to go. I had my megaphone, I had my markers, I was ready to make some signs, I was ready for an action, but Instead, I actually walked into a room full of women who sat around and we talked about our lived experiences and how they related to a particular topic. Later, I actually found out this approach is called consciousness raising, and it's an organizing strategy that the feminist movement adopted from the civil rights movement of the 1960s. The idea here is that by speaking your truth and listening to the truth of others, you're actually making connections and validating your own experience while figuring out that those, ex those problems that you thought were individual problems, they're not individual, but collective. So it was very powerful for me to realize in that room full of women that I'm not the only one who feels overlooked or silenced in male-dominated spaces, but in those spaces of dialogue and connection, I was also able to hear from women whose experiences were different from mine and who did not share the same identities as I. It created a space for solidarity. Their issues became my issues. For the first time, I saw my existence in the larger social and political context, and it made me feel grounded. Of course, recently, I traded my megaphone in for the classroom. Now I work with lots of college students, helping them figure themselves out through this sort of facilitated conversations around identity and social issues. Usually we expect for kids to have to do that on their own, right? By bumping into circumstances, experiences, or people that are either going to reinforce or punish them, depending on what identities they hold. So you have queer children in Latinx households who learn pretty early on that masculinity is at the top of the gender hierarchy and to hide any inclination towards the feminine. Or you have upper middle class children who see themselves reflected in their neighborhoods, in their schools, on television, and they might assume, hey, nobody has to worry about paying the bills on time or getting that second job to pay for tuition. So these are snapshots of reality that usually form a pretty unreliable and incomplete map that really don't allow us to know exactly where we stand and where our peers stand. So we come together 
in a, in a group full of people from diverse backgrounds to begin to unravel those multiple and complicated layers of identity that make us who we are. All right, I'm not gonna lie to you. This is a pretty powerful process, but it also requires a lot of vulnerability, a lot of honesty, and a lot of courage. But let's get down to business. How do I get a bunch of 18 to 21 year olds to sit around and share their deepest and most personal stories in a room full of their peers? I'll tell you how. <laughs> Free pizza. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. My students are back there saying like, she never brought pizza for us, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, actually, the way we set up this magical sounding place is pretty straightforward. We gotta create expectations that are gonna promote this type of dialogue and, and really encourage vulnerability. I'll call them ground rules. And there's only a couple of conditions to make them work. First, they gotta be agreed upon by the group. We have to come to a collective decision on what, what they will be. Secondly, they gotta be flexible. So we can add to them, take away, or edit them as the conversation develops and as we see fit. But usually, in my experience, they end up looking a little something like this. First, we gotta agree on expectations. Because when we come into a room with a group that has very different experiences from our own, but we know that we're there for the same reason, we know that we're there to delve deep into identity and talk about social issues that matter to us, well, then it's much easier for us to develop trust it's much easier for us to give openness and to receive that openness and to address any issues that might arise. Of course, we also want to ask our participants to be aware of how they show up. How do they take up space in the room, right? And we use this little rule called step up, step back. So for example, if you're someone like me who does not mind raising their hands and always participating and you're just ready to go, you're an extrovert, or if you have identities that are privileged or belong to a dominant group, but we ask you to challenge yourself. Step back. Maybe take some moments to listen. Conversely, if you're more in the introverted side of things, if you're a little shy, or if you hold identities that have been historically underrepresented, well, we ask you to step up. Challenge yourself to really have your voice heard. That way we're modeling an equitable environment in which all voices can be honored. Of course, in that room full of people that are different, somebody's bound to say something you disagree with, right? Somebody's bound to maybe say something that is even considered problematic or offensive. So how do we keep each other accountable? Well, we ask for folks to call each other in instead of calling each other out. Now, why is that? I know that calling out is sort of this natural response to hearing something problematic, but it really shuts down dialogue altogether, and it really, is not, it fails to give us that educational opportunity that we're looking for, right? So what's the difference? How do we call someone in instead of calling them out? Well, for example, if someone says something that I hear pretty commonly, hey, I don't see color, right? I can respond by saying, you know colorblindness is actually a form of racism that perpetuates white supremacy? I could, I could do that. Or I could say something a little bit like, so, I'm wondering where you learned that from. Could you speak a little bit more about you know, where that comes from? Because as a person of color, actually, my race and ethnicity are a pretty important part of my identity, and they're a positive part of my identity. So when you say something like, you don't see color, it kind of makes me feel like maybe you don't see my experiences. You see the difference there? Of course, uh, if you do say something that is harmful or hurtful to someone, we've got to make sure that we own up to it. So we have to own not just the intention of our words, but also the impact that they might have on someone. How does that happen? Well, if we acknowledge that the words or actions that we might have done have been hurtful, that's the first step, acknowledging, accepting, and of course, educating ourselves on what it is that we might have done wrong. Now, we don't want to put the, educate, the labor of educating you back on the person that you might have hurt, right? So we want to make sure that we're responsible for educating ourselves, and then, of course, doing better next time. That's the most important part. But none of these rules are really going to work if we don't use that golden rule of conversation and dialogue, which is to actively listen. What does it look like to listen actively instead of just kind of hearing what someone has to say? Well, the easiest way to describe it is really to try to genuinely seek to understand someone else's perspective. Listening to understand, not just to respond to what a person's saying. Pretty simple, right? 
well, actually, it takes a lot of practice, but it really can change the nature of the dialogue and really deepen it. Last but not least, and this one might sound a little bit weird to you, we have to not just accept, but welcome discomfort in our conversations. Now, I can already hear my mommy, ay Dios mio, mija, what are you going to talk about? Who are you going to make uncomfortable this time, right? Because we've been conditioned to not really talk about controversial topics, to maybe prioritize people's comforts over meaning in a conversation. But if we're going to challenge preconceived notions, if we are going to actually learn from people whose lived experiences are vastly different from our own, we've got to give ourselves room to be a little uncomfortable. Because it's uncomfortable to acknowledge and accept that our knowledge is partial. We don't know everything. And we have to unlearn some of the things that we've learned in order to learn what was right. So this type of approach really creates the dialogue where connections can happen, where people can learn about themselves and each other in a space that is brave. Now, these are by no means a comprehensive list of rules, right? But maybe they can get you started in creating the types of environments in which dialogue across difference can actually take place. But so what? I mean, isn't this just another way to coddle or snowflake little millennials into this bubble that doesn't even mirror real life? I mean, why are we teaching them to sit around and talk about their feelings? Well, I'll tell you why. It's my job to make sure that my students are successful citizens of the world, right? And that means preparing them for this world, this diverse and ever-changing global community. In my field, we call this learning to work across difference. And it's usually followed by all these fun buzzwords like creating young adults that are ready for the global economy or creating global citizens. And yes, of course, I want to make sure that these conversations are going to allow my students to be able to lead people from diverse backgrounds. I know that being culturally competent is going to make them great doctors, lawyers, educators, legislators. Let's hope, right? But I'm going to be real with y'all. I don't do this to make students more competitive in today's global economy or even to make our university more globally renowned. Don't tell them I said that. I'm in the business of creating this type of learning environments because I think we're in pretty dire need of a generation who is conscious of each other's humanity. When we facilitate dialogue across identities that focus on social issues, we're taking the blindfold off to see ourselves and each other and to know that we are connected. And you know what? It's not easy to share experiences and to confront issues like racism, misogyny, or queer phobia. It's not easy to confront our own privilege. But we're not coddling. We're empowering a new generation of students who will understand the power of their voice and of listening to the voices of others so that they may understand that our liberation is intrinsically connected to the liberation of others.